I have a friend that recently told me about um, a trip that he went on uh, using psychedelics and it was quite vivid and he has been quite profoundly impacted by what he experienced and he was uh, sharing it with me a to share what happened and also to encourage me to consider trying uh, um, what it is that he went through now admittedly he didn't do it in Australia he did it in a, in a different country and it was in a quasi medical environment um, it was somewhat experimental um, by people who are from the medical world but it wasn't a registered experience or experiment to say the least and this of course has led to a number of conversations that we've had and it's part of a larger conversation that I have with people around alcohol and drug use and the differences between um, um, recreational and clinical or medicinal use of, of things that have been termed as drugs because I put it in inverted commas because in truth alcohol is a drug often when we think about drugs we say oh that's marijuana or that's uh, mushrooms or heroin or whatever uh, but when I say drugs I mean the things that are not legalized at least not in Australia just so we can use this as a colloquial term so what is it um, about drugs that makes it drugs and then what is it that makes drugs into medicine uh, and, and there's a much larger conversation to be had here but I would like to just share some ideas that relate to a, a spiritual idea that's found in the Torah there's this narrative in the Torah in the section of Shmini where the two sons of Aaron so they are priests ministering in the in the Mishkan so a priest in Judaism is someone who officiates with the religious rite that would take place in the Mishkan sacrifices uh, things like that and their father Aaron is the high priest he's the brother of Moses who is the um, a, a pretty senior person the leader of the Jewish people in the desert and so this story, story takes place I don't know 3330 odd years ago and uh, the two sons of Aaron, not of an avil, they show up to the Mishkan inebriated. And uh, either they've consumed wine or they have uh, used some other substance to get them into a more enlightened state of mind, if, if you will. And this uh, um, results in them dying. They die in the Mishkan during their service and, and there's some sort of miracle process in how that happens and um, we learn a whole lot of things from this story one of the things that comes out is that you cannot be in the service of Hashem one cannot perform the Mishkan rituals if there is alcohol or any other mind-altering uh, substance in the system one needs to be fully present and present of mind and so there's a whole lesson that comes out of that around the importance of, of living life with a presence of mind and, and an awareness of the spirituality but also that um, when we look at the commentaries of the story, uh, most commentaries are quite forgiving on Not of an Avil, and they say that what they did was actually quite altruistic from their perspective. They want to have an elevated experience. They knew they were going to be having this spiritual uh, um, experience within the Mishkan, and they just wanted to, I don't know, put it on crack, if you will, and, uh, and, and on steroids and take it to the next level. And so uh, um, what they wanted was something that was quite pure but it seems that Hashem was very unforgiving and, and, and didn't actually appreciate this spiritual quest so we take out of this uh, an interesting conversation around being drunk or inebriated or under the influence but we also have an interesting uh, um, narrative here around what is the Jewish spiritual position on um, having uh, uh, using drugs and other substances to have a mind-altering experience in the name of something good so just a little halakha a little uh, Jewish law um, if a rabbi has had more than 86 mil of wine um, and admittedly wine is by the Talmudic standard of wine which would have been quite a bit stronger than our wine because the Talmud is uh, 15 1600 years ago wine is made quite differently it's it's we read in the mission of the Talmud that it was more like a, a concentrate which water was then later added to so 
obviously wine is, is considerably stronger than today, not as strong as a spirit, but what the Talmud is saying is that if a rabbi has 86 mil of wine, then the rabbi cannot um, answer legal questions and a priest cannot run the temple service if they have 86 mil of wine in their system. So although that's not a lot of alcohol at all, we see that there's a very strict policy around having no alcohol in the system. If I go, now that doesn't mean alcohol is a bad thing because we see alcohol is, is used in Judaism. It's, we use it in Kiddush, we use it at, a, at circumcisions, we use it at weddings, we use it. It's used to, in all sorts of um, rituals and it is appropriate. But when it comes to the service of Hashem in the Mishkan or the base of Mikdash, or it comes to adjudicating a legal uh, matter, one needs a very, very clear mind. So when the Torah says, you know what, use a substance that might get you a little trippy, then it's allowed. And the only substance that the Torah seems to do that with is wine. But when it comes to doing ritual and, and other things, you cannot have anything in the system. So what was wrong with not even a veal showing up to the Mishkan without, in this enlightened state? So there's this whole conversation around free choice in Judaism and the importance of honoring free choice. And, and that free choice is what makes human beings uniquely different to all other species. And the importance of free choice is that we can have a rational uh, thought process in order to assess what's going on, to be able to take in the environment and the information, and then to be able to make choices as to how we're going to respond. And substances that are going to impair that choice making process um, are not to be used because we're no longer in a position to be able to exercise free choice we're not in a in a, in a position to truly take in what's going on around us and therefore um we're going to uh, um stop i don't know being human for a moment we won't have that 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 advantage we won't have that it's not the right word advantage we won't have that um unique quality and Hashem wants us to be using that. But what if it's for an altruistic purpose like not of an avia? I want to have a high experience. So it seems that uh, Jewish spirituality values the hard slog of using meditation and, and taking one's self on a journey of spiritual enlightenment through the mind rather than through substance. So although not of an avia were in an elevated position, it's not seen as a positive in our tradition. We don't look for the fast way to have a pleasurable spiritual experience because the pleasurable spiritual experience should not be the goal. It's a byproduct. We're not here on a quest of pleasure. We're here on a quest of, um, of, of spiritualizing and sacralizing the world that we're in. And that's through our activities and through our thought processes and the way we speak, etc. Um, and if that's pleasurable, then that's fantastic. And if that's enlightening, that's also fantastic. But the goal can't be enlightenment and pleasure because that would actually be a selfish quest. I want to be enlightened. I want to experience pleasure. And because that is not the purpose, we're not going to um, justify spiritual uh, experience um, through drugs as, as, as being actually a legitimate um, process. Now, of course, there are those who may not agree with this, and there are schools of thought that don't, but I'm presenting a particular school in, in Jewish spiritual thought. But what about if the drugs help make better decisions? For example, in the last uh, few years, we've seen the culmination of many years of research and, and lobbying. We've seen uh, uh, in Australia, we see the legalization of CBD, of cannabis oil, uh, um, and, and around the world, there are government sanctioned experiments using psychedelics in context of post-traumatic stress disorder and other mental health disease. And, and what these pieces of research and what, and what this legalization process is, is enabling is that people with chronic pain and chronic illness, um, terminal illness, and, and, and the pains, uh, um, resulting from that can actually be more functioning. So drugs aren't necessarily bad. And sometimes the chemical impact on the brain could actually help a person be in a more fitting place to be able to make decisions. And that's because Jewish 
tradition in Jewish law recognizes the work of science, medical science, uh, because medical science is there to improve the quality of our life so that we can function. If a person is, is ailing, if a person is suffering mentally, or a person is completely non-functional because of the pain that they're experiencing, then there's no conversation around free choice because they are so disadvantaged by their life situation. But if we can elevate them from that disadvantaged place um, using drugs and substances, that then gets them to a more clearer version of themselves than they were prior, well, then we're actually enabling them to make free choice. Now, you could stretch that and say, well, when I'm in an altered state of consciousness, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm in a better place to be able to make those decisions. Well, I'll let um, science determine that. From a spiritual perspective, we don't accept that. From a spiritual perspective, we don't want to use drugs um, and substance to alter the mind. Rather, we look at it as if we must, because we cannot function to the level that Jewish tradition would like us to be operating on a day-to-day -day level, well, then we're sub. And we therefore require substances to be able to get us into an operational level. And that Jewish law says should be administered by a doctor, by a health specialist, who can help a person attain an equilibrium that will allow them to function in a, in a better way. So that's just a bit around... Uh, the use of, of, of drugs and, and other substances uh, it, to alter the mind. And um, if you've got any questions, feel free to, to comment below or, 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 or shoot me an email via the Spirit Grow website. Um, and uh, uh, let's, let's keep striving for a spiritual awakening and a spiritual improvement in this world through hard work and not through shortcuts. All the best.